okay so let's uh, begin so someone has a question about carbon's oxidation state in methane so see if you look at this uh, slide you you see here four pairs of electrons shared um you know between carbon and hydrogen so, so that's how you get eight so each electron here is spending more time with carbon than with the hydrogen so carbon is not going to be able to accept any more um uh, you know uh, electrons yeah yes it's a total eight electrons not eight positive charge it's not eight plus okay so we move to the next one so there was another question uh, what is protein domain um so all right so what is a protein domain so so protein domain is uh, you know when the polypeptide chain folds into three dimensional structure so you have certain uh, regions that form an independent module like structures and we call them as protein domain like yesterday you saw the Rossman fold that is in um, uh, NAD binding proteins. So these are specific three dimensional structures. Okay, these are a higher order in the hierarchy of structure than the secondary structures, but these are not like the whole protein structure. Sometimes it can be whole protein structure. You know, so certain proteins have uh, one single well conserved domain, meaning that particular structure is seen in other proteins as well in under in other organisms uh, but many proteins uh, particularly larger proteins have multiple independent shapes within them and these independent shapes may be conserved and they could function like a module so you may find like for example if you take um, uh, a protein that acts as a transcription factor so you will have a region that enables it to bind dna and this dna binding part of that protein will have a certain three-dimensional structure and that could be there in many other dna binding proteins as well and in addition to DNA binding to dna that protein might have other domains which might help it to interact with a variety of molecules yeah, a transcription factor might have another domain that interacts with the rna polymerase or it might interact with the protein involved in transcription activation or uh, suppression so you could have modular structures in a protein and these modules may be mixed and matched and such independent three-dimensional structures uh, that are identifiable as specific structure. They are the domains. So is that clear? Um, so yesterday we stopped, uh, you know, with uh, NAD structure, how it accepts uh, electrons in the form of hydride ions, that is two electrons and one proton. And um, so we saw that it is in the, um, this, um, nicotinamide domain like this one attached to another uh, nucleotide that is adenine nucleotide so the two phosphoric acids connect these two so this is like a benzenoid structure this is more like a benzene and when it binds these um, double bonds uh, shift here and that is called quinenoid structure because it resembles quinine so then we stopped at this slide. So where the nicotinamide comes. So the nicotinamide uh, normally comes from niacin. This is a B complex vitamin and it is required in the diet. Although it can be made from tryptophan. So the amount of nicotinamide made from the tryptophan is not sufficient to produce all the NAD that we, do, we want. And sometimes the protein uh, that we have in our food may not have sufficient amount of tryptophan. For example, if you are eating too much of corn uh, and corn is deficient in tryptophan, so you will not have required tryptophan. And that is why its availability in the diet as niacin is critical. Okay. Synthetically, originally people made from nicotine and that is why the names are similar. 
but the nicotine available from tobacco cannot make niacin or nicotinamide okay so smoking is not going to provide the raw precursors to make nad and uh, due to this when the or uh, your diet lacks niacin so you have vitamin deficiency leading to diseases okay and that disease is called pellagra so pellagra is a disease that is characterized by skin uh, infection or you know abnormalities on skin rough skin the, the italian word for that is what is pellagra diarrhea and dementia you know people forget things too so the three d's characterize pellagra and that is caused by niacin so a lot of people used to die due to pellagra earlier particularly in the part of the world where people were dependent on corn for for example southwest united states used to have a problem of deficiency of niacin then these three scientists identified that uh the main uh, defect is the absence of niacin in the diet okay so someone else i forgot the name identified it is due to the uh, nutritional deficiency and these three people identified the deficient nutrient is actually niacin and niacin is a very inexpensive molecule and it can easily be supplemented in uh, one of the many things that you eat in a daily basis and that takes care of pellagra and pellagra is eradicated in the developed world but you know since uh, our priorities as i told you previously when we were talking about vitamin a for want of a quarter of a carrot a lot of children go blind similarly we have um, niacin deficiency particularly north central deccan plateau still pellagra persists so many of you should think about such things you know when i want to build a career when you think about high faith things you need to realize as a large part of our problems are these kind of very mundane things okay not because we lack uh, big machines or sophisticated uh, equipments or algorithms or defense weapons and so on so we still have nutritional deficiencies okay the next uh, electron carrier that we need to familiarize ourselves with is flavin nucleotides so here enters the cinsine the next b complex vitamin so this vitamin is riboflavin okay so riboflavin let me write the spelling so riboflavin so this is uh, the vitamin this is again another b complex vitamin and its main structure is this uh, isoalaxacin ring as you see here so this ring is called isoalaxacin ring and this is the one that is involved in electron carrying temporarily and um, so this one might exist Well, like above this pink dashed line so this is flavin mononucleotide so this is the structure of the flavin mononucleotide and if it is in dinucleate you know linkage with adenine nucleotide just like in nad then you call it as fad flavin adenine dinucleotide so it exists in both forms so some of the enzymes carry this and some of the enzyme carry fad and uh, an important difference from nad or nadp is that uh, the proteins that uh, that use flavin nucleotides as electron carrier the the flavin moiety is tightly bound to the enzyme sometimes it is even covalently bound so therefore this is a good example of a prosthetic group you know when we talk about prosthetic group meaning the cofactor that is tightly bound to the enzyme rather than a cofactor that is loosely bound so nad is loosely bound it can get reduced by one reaction uh, at the active site of one enzyme then it can freely diffuse out and participate in another uh, enzymatic reaction whereas flavin nucleotides don't do that so these temporarily hold the electrons 
uh, in the active site you know when the electrons are taken from a substrate or donated to a substrate so these temporarily hold electrons in this isoalloxacin ring as you see here and the type of electron transfer here is single electron and single proton in so hydride ion as you saw in nad here it is one proton one electron so basically one hydrogen atom and this nitrogen temporarily acquires a positive charge and that is semi quinone okay so then it can accept one more and it gets um, you know reduced fadh2 or fmnh2 so this is fully reduced so therefore this flavin nucleot nucleotide containing enzymes can participate in reactions where you need to take two electrons from a donor and give one electron at a time to an acceptor which may accept only one electron at a time so we will encounter this kind of reactions when we go into oxidative phosphorylation and photosynthesis for example in photosynthesis when you uh, take up electrons by oxidizing water usually to release um, um you know a, a molecular oxygen two molecules of water are split so you end up getting four uh, electrons and four protons and there is there should be some carrier that should be able to take four accept four electrons and the next step where the electrons are transferred those acceptors takes one electron at a time so you need an electron carrier that can handle uh, numbers within that should be able to take one to four readily and should be able to give one to four you know like it may it may need to give one at a time four times are four in one go or two at a time twice and so on so it should be able to handle in the range of 1 to 4 so here fadh2 and fmnh uh, can handle in terms of accepting one at a time twice and donating two in one go or one at a time twice so that is what uh, these can do and due to these features um these uh, flavin nucleotides participate in a higher diversity of reactions than what nad does but nad using enzymes are large numbers okay overall but in terms of the diversity the flavin proteins flavo proteins you know the proteins that contain flavin nucleotides as cofactors they are uh, more diverse and uh, another interesting feature is if you remember we learned about the reduction potential standard reduction potential etc so here the reduction potential of fad and fmn varies depending on how this ring structure is influenced by the binding to the uh, enzyme active site uh, so depending on the tightness with which they are bound the reduction potential may be altered so these are uh, characteristics of the flavin nucleotides so two primary things that you do not want to forget are it can take one electron at a time or two electrons in one go and it can donate one electron at a time or two electrons in one go that is one second these are prosthetic groups these are tightly bound and their absorption spectra again varies among the different forms like um, fad fully oxidized one partially oxidized one fully reduced one so all of them have characteristic absorption spectrum and that is very useful in assaying their um uh, you know oxidation state so with this we have equipped ourselves with the knowledge required to get into metabolism so the one of the primary things we learned is we are talking about molecular conversions where energy is involved either energy is required for the reaction or due to the reaction energy is liberated and where is this energy coming from we learned that it is to do with the kind of atoms and the kind of bonds that are there and that is what makes some molecules um like the person standing on the 6 feet tall diving board or someone stand in the water so that is one main thing so that is how the chemical energy difference we understand
and the second thing is in biology this difference is primarily in terms of electron affinity so therefore we learnt about the electrochemical relationship um so so we we learnt about how the difference in delta e is connected to delta g okay um so we learnt about this uh, transducer all those things so we have gotten the basic bioenergetic uh, foundations required and now we also saw uh, the energy release is in incremental form it is not like you explode a bomb to get the a little bit energy that you need to charge your mobile phone okay so you get it in increments and that is where we have this intermediate electron carriers coupled to transducers so so we we haven't yet gone into the transducer concept very seriously so we will get it get to it at some point so now we have learned about this intermediate steps so having equipped with all this fundamental knowledge and we also learned about the type of biochemical reactions remember oxidation reduction reaction carbon carbon bond formation and breakage there the importance of carbonyl carbons a uh, partial positive charge on the carbon partial negative charge on the oxygen and how that would influence um the charge on an adjacent carbon becoming carbanion then we saw the internal rearrangement isomerization and so on so with all these uh, knowledge now we will get into an actual biochemical pathway okay so that biochemical pathway if you want to learn one biochemical pathway in your life and that biochemical pathway is glycolysis okay so the word tells you it is slicing a carbohydrate molecule right glyco we know is a common generic thing and gluco means it refers to one monosaccharide that is glucose if you want to name a general carbohydrate thing you use the word glyco so here lysis means breaking down so it is splitting some carbohydrate that's what the name is so here actually we split glucose okay it is actually glucolysis that's what happens so this is the best understood of all biochemical pathways so when we talk about best understood we don't mean just the sequence of the reactions or the structures of the intermediates in addition we also mean the nature of the enzymes the mechanism of their catalysis reversibility or irreversibility of the reaction thermodynamic um, you know aspects of that reaction regulation of this reaction and how the intermediates are connected to other biochemical pathways in all that aspects in its entirety glycolysis is the best understood biochemical pathway and second uh, this is a central pathway in the metabolism in all organisms so it is highly conserved in that sense okay and also the mechanisms involved in the interconversions that happen here they are also conserved all the way from bacteria to human so in summary this occupies the central thing in terms of evolutionary conservation of the mechanisms importance to the organism and that importance being similarly important in all organisms in all those respects this is a central uh, pathway okay so now briefly let us look at the major things that can happen to glucose so glucose may be joined with the glucose glucose multiple of them and make starch glycogen or convert isomerize into fructose and you have glucose fructose disaccharide that is sucrose this is what sugar cane does and stores in the uh, sugar cane uh, sap in its stem starch in all the grains glycogen in our liver okay so this is one thing that can happen to glucose that comes in the diet are produced by photosynthesis um so photosynthesis end result is producing glucose and what else can happen to glucose it can be oxidized to pyruvic acid via glycolysis 
and this pyruvic acid is partially oxidized product from glucose it can be fully oxidized to carbon dioxide through another cycle that we will learn after glycolysis and the third thing it can provide the five carbon sugar the ribose required for nucleic acid biosynthesis okay because nucleic acid backbone is ribose so all these things come from glucose so it can be storage of energy primary source of energy and it can also provide the raw material or precursors for other important macromolecules in the cell so this is the metabolic fate of glucose right so this i just told you glycolysis means splitting of glucose so so uh, this again i told you major principles and methods of biochemistry arose from the study of glycolysis okay through the process of trying to understand glycolysis when people discovered a lot about enzymes enzyme kinetics properties of enzymes their active site and um, how substrate binds to enzyme reaction mechanism all those many principles of biochemistry came from uh, research on glycolysis and this again i told you it is a universal central pathway of glucose and this is true in multiple organisms and that's why we call it as universal and um, the mechanisms of this conversion the, the chemistry of glycolysis is again uh, completely conserved the way glucose becomes glucose 6 for phosphate the first reaction in e coli is the way it happens in our body too so it has been totally conserved for about 3 billion years all right so with that uh, introduction to its importance let us uh, start looking at the individual steps okay so so the first step is energizing or activating glucose for further reactions so that is getting rid of this poor leaving group and adding this good leaving group this is phospho uh, phosphoryl group transfer remember one of the third variety of the reactions that we learned is group transfer and in that we learned about phosphoryl group transfer and there we thought we did have this very example like carbohydrates get phosphorylated and they are the energized version that participate in reactions for example to make glycogen or starch you don't add glucose glucose that uh, thing actually comes from um, a phosphorylated version of glucose and this is catalyzed by hexokinase uh, a highly conserved enzyme and there are um, uh, you know the, enzyme family there is another one called glucokinase so we don't get into those details if we understand that a, a, a enzyme that phosphorylates a hexose like glucose we call it as hexokinase and the phosphoryl group transfer is from atp so if you remember the how atp is used it's not that atp is hydrolyzed to adp plus phosphate instead the phosphate group may be temporarily transferred to the enzyme and from there and then adp is released and from the enzyme the phosphate group may be transferred to glucose in this case and uh, one important thing we want to consider here is this atp and magnesium so they usually exist together as a coordinated structure shown here so this divalent uh, cation takes care of charges of two acid groups of adjacent phosphates so this is actually magnesium atp my two minus charges so this and this or you know whichever like it could be coordinated between these two and these two may be free or this may be here so this is what is magnesium atp so atp when it is actually existing in our cell it exists like in this form and this true with magnesium adp as well and this is how um, they are participating in this reaction so this is the first step glucose 6 phosphate formation from glucose and the next step is 
uh, something that we have learnt about its importance. That is the importance of carbonyl carbon. Okay, so that is the context in which we learnt this. Why glucose six phosphate has to become fructose six phosphate. So this is an isomerization because glucose and fructose are isomers. So that isomerization. So this is internal rearrangement of bonds. Primarily. Uh, switching a double bond from first carbon to the second carbon, so that is what is it's happening. So this in linearized form, as we will see in the next picture. Yeah. <coughs> so this is the linearized version of glucose. So when it binds to the active side of the enzyme, phosphohexose isomerase. So the shaded blue. Is the enzyme's active site? So this is like the active site. This is like the other parts of the enzyme. So in the active site, first the ring structure binds and it readily opens because ring structure is always in equilibrium with this linear structure. And this double bond from carbon one switches to carbon two. So it is internal rearrangement of double bond. That is what happens. Um, in this reaction, so now let us look at how uh, this reaction happens in the active site. So remember, we have learned in uh, enzyme uh, catalysis in terms of the mechanisms of enzyme catalysis. Uh, the of course the general thing applicable to all enzymes we learned is the binding energy, the multiple non-covalent interactions that happen between. Enzyme active site and substrate uh, provides significant part of the energy required to reduce the activation energy. So that's one thing. Second, we learned that in the enzyme active site we may have proton donors and proton acceptors, and that kind of a thing we call as general acid-base catalysis. And sometimes that will. Stabilize and charged intermediate by providing proton or accepting proton. So that example we see here. Okay, that reaction mechanism example. So there we just learnt as one of the possible reaction mechanisms. Here we see that as an example here. That time also we had a part of these molecules, and this we have already sort of done there in that example. So here we see the actual reaction. So here you have a base that can temporarily accept this uh, proton, and that allows a double bond switching to here, and therefore this will become hydroxyl. So that would be ene and diol intermediate. See, so this is an ene alkene, and you have two alkyl groups. Therefore, it is an ene and diol intermediate. So it's cis because both are on the same side of this double bond. This trans isomerism coming here. Okay, uh, once that enadiol or intermediate forms, uh, so the required proton comes from the solvent. So he, mostly it's all aqueous medium, so proton is not an issue. And then uh, this uh, transfer of protons and back this accepting. Um, uh, sorry, donating the proton and accepting electron, like the reverse of what happened here, ends up making the double bond here, and this becomes single. So essentially, the double bond with in the first carbon now has become the second one. Okay, so why this rearrangement? Now you see this carbon adjacent to this carbonyl carbon will be a carbanion. Okay, it will have a tendency readily to lose hydrogen attached to it, and that enables the cleavage here into two trioses. Okay, three carbon carbons. That's what is going to happen uh, when we actually have that lysis. To justify the name of this pathway, the pathway name is glycolysis, and the lysis actually happens. Between the third and the fourth carbon, and that is facilitated by the formation of this double bond here. This is the main reason why glucose becomes fructose. And the actual thing version of glucose is glucose six phosphate ends up becoming fructose six phosphate. And now ring closer and dissociation from the 
active site. So this is the reaction mechanism of phosphor exosisomerase. So we, uh, we will go through uh, at least four different reaction mechanisms here and you need to remember, read, understand and remember these reaction mechanisms one of them will come in the exam. So therefore, glycolysis reaction mechanism, you cannot say you will not be able to study. I know you are capable of learning a lot more than this because you have already done that uh, and there is evidence that you can really do this. So, so the primary objective is going from carbonyl group from carbon 1 to carbon 2 that enables cleavage between 3 and 4. So that's the main thing that you need to remember here. So third one is another priming step. One more phosphate gets added. That is fructose 6-phosphate become, becomes fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Meaning the second phosphate is not added to the first phosphate. Instead, it is added to another hydroxyl group on a different carbon of fructose. <coughs> and this is catalyzed by phosphofructokinase. Kinase means something that transfers phosphoryl group an enzyme that transfers phosphorine group. Once again, the donor is ATP. So here actually we are consuming energy. Okay, twice we have taken ATP. We haven't yet started realizing the benefit of oxidation here. This is like adding your, you know, you need to release energy from the firewood, but to light up the firewood, you need to provide a light, like your matchbox. And that is what we are doing here. So phosphofractokinase um, phosphorylates the first carbon and you get this fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So this reaction is irreversible. It goes only in one direction. Of course, when it participates ATP, your magnesium is always involved. So now you understand the importance of metal ions uh, in food okay these are important for uh, reactions in the body and the product the fructose 1,6 bisphosphate can only participate in glycolysis it does not get into any other metabolic pathway so therefore there is no point in producing this molecule if it is not for the continued progression through glycolysis if glycolysis is not required then this enzyme is subject to serious regulation it will be inhibited so that you don't make this molecule because this can only participate in glycolysis rather this phosphorylation commits fructose 6 phosphate to glycolysis okay otherwise this can go into many other things by undergoing this phosphorylation it is committing to glycolysis that is why it is called a committed step so this committed step is not synonymous with the rate limiting step. Rate limiting step meaning in a series of reactions, the individual reaction whose rate is slowest compared to the other individual reactions. So therefore the overall pathway speed depends on that one particular reaction and they are the rate limiting uh, steps. Sometimes the committed step may be the rate limiting step as well, but these need not be always connected. They are independent. And due to this commitment, this enzyme is subject to serious regulation. So we will learn about the enzyme regulation after learning glycolysis. So next, um, the, the central reaction of glycolysis, which is splitting the hexose on the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate now gets cleaved into, that is between the third carbon and fourth carbon you cleave. And in its linear structure, you have ketone. Uh, if we go back, see you have the ketone and therefore it is going to become dihydroxy acetone phosphate. Okay. But due to the presence of ketone, it is going to be an acetone because this is an uh, acetone structure in which you have two hydroxyl groups and one hydroxyl group is in um, ester linkage with phosphate. So therefore, it is called dihydroxyacetone phosphate or very affectionately DHAP. Okay, that's what is formed. And the other one, the bottom part of the molecule, 4, 5, 6 will be aldehyde. Okay, 
So this is characterized by aldolase. So here, remember the second type of rea generalized reactions that we learned is carbon-carbon uh, bond formation or break of the carbon-carbon bond. And here you see an example of carbon-carbon bond. And we learned that carbonyl groups help in this bond formation or bond breakage. So that is where we learned aldol condensation as well as uh, glycine condensation, where it is in an ester form, it is glycine. Otherwise, they both are similar. So this is reverse of an aldol condensation. These two joining together to make fructose is the aldol condensation. Okay. And that is why this enzyme is called aldolase. And its reaction mechanism obviously important and we need to learn. And that is described in the next slide. So again, ring binding and ring opening. And the central thing here in this reaction mechanism, in the previous one, we saw enediol intermediate formation and its stabilization based on base catalysis, uh, how it is helping that. Here it is shifts base formation between the amino group of lysine side chain. You know, lysine side chain is CH2, 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 MH2. And that amino group participates in this. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, nucleophil and this is positively charged one. And this nucleophilic attack leads to the Schiff's base formation. So this is an imine version of the Schiff's base. And once this forms, this charge is taken care by a base catalysis here. So this, um, you know, readily accepts an electron or you can say, um, you know, this proton is abstracted and therefore it is justifying base catalysis. And that uh, leads to a double bond here, you know, the, a proper uh, shift base. Then you look this side. Here you have an acid as well as a base groups available for acid and base catalysis with this direction of electron flow. Again, an abstraction of proton leading to a double bond here. Okay, and that leads to a cleavage because here if it is going to be double bond, then carbon cannot have this. And that's how this cleavage is enabled. Okay, and this will therefore end up being CHO. So that is glycerol aid phosphate. And that is going to be released in the next one. The actual bond cleavage and the first product release will be the step here. So the glyceraldehyde phosphate is released and this is temporarily an enamine intermediate is the attached to the active site. Now the donation of this uh, proton, the base catalyst uh, group has now acts as an acid and that uh, leads to this hydroxyl group and switching the double bond now to this. Actually, the reverse of what we saw in the cover reaction one and two. And then uh, you have the hydrolysis of that leading to release of the dihydroxyacetone phosphate and the enzyme gets restored through solvent-based proton exchange to the original shape. So this is how um, the fructose 1,6-phosphate gets cleaved into glycerol DH3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. This is a very important reaction mechanism. So you are not going to miss this. Take the required amount of time, go through it multiple times. If needed, take an introductory organic chemistry textbook, learn the mechanisms of electron abstraction, proton abstraction, nucleophil attack, electrophil attack, shifts base, all that, that are required, learn thoroughly and patiently and be clear with the reaction mechanism of all the lists. Because this is very, very important in our understanding of glycolysis. And the next one is essentially this glycerol A3 phosphate is what is going to participate in the subsequent reactions. So as a result, this three carbon uh, moiety needs to be isomerized. The bonds have to be rearranged here 
again a double bond switch just like what we saw uh, in in two steps ago the same thing here the double bond rearrangement uh, carbonyl group uh, from here to this and you get glycerol a3 phosphate so this is catalyzed by triose phosphate isomerase because both are triose uh, for, sorry this is triose and this is um, you know uh, keto sugar this not um, um you can't directly call it as triose so triose phosphate isomerase catalyzes this interconversion and since the subsequent reactions will um you know siphon off glycerol a3 phosphate this dihydroxystone phosphate eventually gets converted into glycerol a3 phosphate okay so this is the fifth step now you have the yielding energy yielding phase starting okay so till now we have invested two atp molecules per glucose per hexose now that is cleaved into two trioses so now when we talk about glycerol a3 phosphate per glucose molecule that entered here it should be two so therefore from now onwards everything should be considered two molecules as if they are going through so for one molecule of glucose this reaction is actually twice that means the means for one molecule of glucose you have two nad oxidase nad uh, getting reduced to nadh okay so the electrons are stored in this temporarily so the energy is conserved in making this okay so roughly one reduced nad equals 3 electrons so there are 3 atps so you have actually have 6 atp forming power uh, from a single glucose molecule so if you subtract the two atp invested initially so you have got four net atp gain at this uh, dehydrogenation step remember oxidation reduction reactions in biology is often dehydrogenations meaning hydrogen atoms are lost and usually it is two hydrogen atoms and that's exactly what you see in this case and uh, this aldehyde now gets oxidized to an acid carboxylic acid which is in um anhydride linkage mixed anhydride linkage with the phosphoric acid that is 13 phosphoglycerate 